In the real estate industry, design and techniques are the defining factors and foundation of achieving the best construct. Whether in the real estate, oil and gas, or any kind of engineering, many industries utilize 3D modeling for a range of products. Now, using 3D designs enables customers and clients to have a full idea and concept of the proposed 3D structure from start to finish. This is extremely useful for envisioning the final product during pitches or to other stakeholders. On the show today, we will be focusing on the real estate sector with specific emphasis on 3D modeling. Welcome to Business Insight on Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadone. Welcome back. Three-dimension modeling is a science and art of creating real-life impression and presentation of development proposal. It is a way of mimicking the interpretation of brain-eye combination of human beings. It can be done as physical paper model or as a computer model. Well, joining us on the show today is Benedict Ebe, architect, 3D interior designer, and he's with Afri Benny Works Nigeria Limited. Many thanks for joining us on Business Insight on Plus TV Africa. Oh, hi. Pleased to meet you, Justin. All right, let's talk about this uh, 3D model and design. Uh, a whole lot has been said, but to break it down to people watching, what, it is, what is it really about? Okay, um, what we take to site and when we start construction is 2D, what we have on paper. But 3D really exposes you to um, some things look great in our minds colors, patterns, and then we end up constructing them in real life. And you find out, uh, not so great, actually. And then what 3D, model, what 3D models do for us is, you know, we can change the colors, you know, re-render, you can change the colors, the patterns, whatever you want to do. You can see it in 3D models before you take it to real life. So it's it's less expensive, you know, you, you don't have to, the opportunity costs, all, all those costs, you, you avoid all of them, so you don't have to break things, and you do it on the system before you even go any further. So that's what it has done, it's very futuristic, and it's very helpful, trust You me. talked about futuristic, uh, yeah. meaning that, uh, is it like a novel idea, as it has been practiced for quite a while now? Oh, funny enough, it, it, has, it has been around for a while, it has been around for a while, but in Nigeria, um, We've slowly been adopting it, actually. It's, it, um, I know back in architectural school, it's, it's been there. 3D modeling has been there in architectural school, but it, it wasn't something that was thought in depth. It, it, it wasn't taught, rather, in depth in, in architectural school. You, you, you find out the, there was so much focus on 2D modelings and sketches because it, it takes us a little back. But when you check the competition out there, you find out that 3D modelings, um, models have been around since early 2000s. It has been there. You know, that's, that's what, and they even take it to the next level abroad, where it's not just about visuals now. You, you can check building credibility. You can calculate the lumens of light that um, a smart building is supposed to use. So you don't waste so much energy. You, know, you can test it on models. You can test lights. You can test its um, ventilation system. You know, sometimes we just guess, oh, this place should use 1.5 horsepower AC. should use 2 horsepower, 1 horsepower. But you know, we can test that with 3D models over there, you, the, the power you're, consumption, you're consuming, so many other things. They do um, the position of the building you can um, use relative to sunlight. Okay, this particular area, you, using Google Map, you can check, okay, this is the amount of sunlight hitting a particular building at a particular point in time, how much heat the building is generating, and then you can know how much power, how much um, air conditioning, how much light, you know, um, stack effects, a, a couple of things that you, you can calculate with 3D modeling. That's what has been happening out there. But we are currently adopting now the visual parts of it, and I know we're growing towards that level, and I know if you, in the near future, we'll definitely get to that level. All right. Uh, yeah. it, it has a whole lot of potentials, and it looks very, very wonderful. Yeah. But in terms of cost, let's talk about cost benefit analysis right now. Yeah. In terms of costing, uh, is it something that is um, readily available, something that's uh, readily affordable for you know, architects who might just be starting up? Okay, it, it is readily available to, for architects who... Um, these, these days, it's, um, 
there, there's quality. Um, there's something, there's a 3D model, and then there's something we call rendering. Rendering is where we take, oh, you, you model something, you, you model a space. I could model this space like this studio where we're in oh. now. Um, we could change a couple of things in the model. But rendering now takes it, it makes it realistic. So it goes from that cartoon looking thing, and then you start to edit the materials. Okay, um, um, how do walls react? You, you check this is cement, it doesn't um, reflect. You take away the reflectivity, you, you put the grooves in wood, all of these things. So that is when it gets to rendering, that is where it gets heavy, where you need um, a system that can handle it at the point in time. So a, for a country like us, I feel 3D modeling is something, during the model stages, you use it to gather funding. You know, you can use it to gather funding, grow as, a, as an architect, practicing in the industry. You, you use it to gather funding, but like my father used to say, a workman cannot be better than his tools. Yeah. So as you gather funding, you invest in your business, and then you can get some of those systems that improve your rendering subsequently as it, as it goes, because those are the parts that need something expensive. And then people render, you know, you can render 720p, picture quality, 1080p, um, 3, 3K, 4K, you know, all the way to 8K. So yeah. it depends on the kind of um, um, engine, render engine or, or computer systems that you have. But you can make money at every level. You don't have to get to the point where you're rendering 4K. You, it, it's a ladder. You can render at 720p for some projects. You know, it, it will come off good. You can use it, you know, a couple of bungalows, a couple of some interior spaces, you know, like a bedroom. A, somebody's asking for a living room, a kitchen. You can do that. But you want to do a whole project, a, a full project. You want to do like a mall or something. You want to do like a commercial space. Then you know that you have to have grown and earned money from doing a living room, doing this you gathered money, and then you get the render engine that can do those kind of commercial projects that you're probably um, hunting okay. for. Mm. Okay, let's talk about uh, you know the industry, really, because uh, a lot of times uh, people believe that um, architecture, as it is, is uh, some brain tasking, uh, brainstorming kind of, uh, you know, uh, field of study, you know, from the university and all of that, because before now, we were told that uh, you have to be very patient, you have to be very artistic yeah. to be an architect, you know, I haven't spent um, six years. Uh, but then yeah. again, how do you see the industry in Nigeria in terms of, um, you know, uh, how things are done internationally? Are we really doing things the right way? Okay, we, we are doing things the right way. Actually, I, architecture, I, I won't lie, is very tasking. And I'm not saying this because I'm an architect. Mm. And it takes a lot of patience. I remember um, in my third year, I, when I was doing my IT, I was going to stop architecture for one You're reason. You're going to stop? Yes, I was going to stop for one reason. I was doing my IT, I was going to stop for one reason. Oh, wow. it, it, it's, a very, it's a very weird reason. Okay, I was, I was working in an office here, yeah. and that office, they were vetting ShopRite designs. Mm. Um, you know, those times they were designed in South Africa, but you know, when it comes into a new country, the, it has to be acclimatized, the design has to be acclimatized into the, the rules, yes, yeah. to suit the rules that guide um, our building mm. sector here in Nigeria. So, um, I had a senior architect, his name uh, is Wally at the okay. time. He was working there at the firm. And he was responsible for designing the car park. You know, when people just come and then you see a car park, you, you, you're like, eh. It's, I think that we need to even design. Uh, you have, have, to, to, you have to design a car park because oh, wow. if, if you're looking at, oh, this particular building is going to have like a thousand people mm. um, going in and out at a particular point in time, you now think to yourself, okay, it should have... Um, how many people can be in a car? Maybe two to, f maybe four or five people in a car. Yes. Meaning 1,000 divided by five. It mm. means you should have a car park that can take 200 cars. Mm. You understand? Yes. Oh, wow. So when you have, you have to manipulate that space to suit 200 cars. If not, you would not get approval or something close to 200 cars. Mm. You understand? So um, um, there's your turning radius. You know, pe people don't, there's a lot of calculations. There's a turning radius. You know that, oh, you must have a nine to ten meter space for a sedan. Okay, now you're speaking to a whole lot of technical you, you, things. You know, it's, 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 it's like that. So yeah. what, what made me to, I found out that he had, he had this designated space that he had to do so, so amount of um, parking. And he was working on that for about two months. You know, he would do the parking, the turning radius, then he would 
they will submit it and say, no, you know what, he didn't meet the requirements. Some of the things are wrong. You have to provide for um, people um, um, people who can't walk and, and all of that. You have to create a different kind of car park. You know, all, all of those things. And I now thought to myself, I wake up, get to work, 8 or 9 o'clock, and I'm working on a car park from then till 5 p.m., every day for two months. Some people can run mad. You need, you need, you need a, a kind of mental psyche, mm. you know, to be able to... You, monotony can kill you in, in architecture. Some projects, they can give you a project and say, you know what, that project, you can be working on the same project for six months. Mm. All you know that, all you know is you wake up in the morning, you're going to the office to do this particular thing. You are seeing the same thing for six months. Oh, wow. So if you don't have the patience, if you don't have the mental psyche to say, okay, this is what I want to do, you, all you do is sleep, eat, you wake up, you're thinking about your design, you can get very out of touch. So I, I thought to myself, well, is, is this what I want to do? Car park like? for two months, <laughs> you know? So I, I was thinking, I was very discouraged, but you know, I, I can't be stubborn too. I mm. just say, uh, you know what, I'm doing this and I'm here. All right. So that's, that's it. Um, so the question. The question is, yes. um, uh, how uh, are we doing in Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis in comparison to global standards? Okay, I standards? think we have been doing we have been doing really nicely. I don't know for some reason a lot of architects they are, the names are as keeping my head right now. I, I can name a lot of architectural okay. firms that have been doing really good. Even in the international, they are getting awards in the international um, um, world in West Africa, in Africa, and even abroad generally. You know, we've, we've been doing well. I, I feel like we've um, gone past, we had a phase of not being appreciated. You know, okay. everybody just feels, oh, I want a two bedroom. We can get Babahu to just cut here, cut here. What, what is there? In, That's the thing. You know, the day with the Nigerians, the average Nigerians, does the average Nigerian patronize an architect to draw designs for their structures? Yeah. yeah yes. Now have we, we gotten to that level? Yes, we, we, yes, we have. Yes, we have. Uh, um, when, like, the island, you know, that's why a lot of people are having that urban shift to the island and parts of the mainland, you know, Ikeja, Magodo, Bagada, a lot of those places, they are really moving into the appreciation of architects. People don't know that, oh, it's one thing to just cut spaces. It's another thing to know that, oh, your bedrooms should face um, the east where the sun rises, because when the sun rises, heat is supposed to enter your bedroom to drive you away from bed while your living room should be cool mm. because it is facing towards the west. Oh, wow. You understand? That's, that's new to me. Yeah, so during sunset, it has rotated towards the west and your living room is getting hot, but your bedroom is cooling. Okay, oh, wow. Do you understand? So there are a lot of things that come into architecture. It is not just cutting out spaces. You understand? There, there are a lot of, so people are starting to realize that. And then the increase in value of land People now know that I can't just call somebody to cut spaces, cut spaces. When you get to Ikoyi and see that some places are 600,000 per square meter, you can't go and throw a lobby of five or, or six meters in a lobby. You realize that, oh, you have done a 30 square meter lobby at 600,000 per square meter. Mm -hmm. How much have you used in the lobby? So that has really pushed people to start to appreciate architects and um, what we're doing with the space, what we're doing. They need someone who understands space programming, then interior design, um, anthropometrics, the um, human form in relation to his environment, you know, some of these things, that, that has really pushed it. it has, so architecture is really improving in Nigeria. It, it, it is. It is improving, but what more do you really think um, the government can do in terms of uh, maybe uh, creating um, a level playing ground or in terms of, uh, you know, all that is needed to make um, the industry move for, forward? What more can be done? Can be done by the government. Okay, there was... There was something I, I raised, which is um, the reason why the course has become so bastardized is, is because it takes a lot to become an architect in Nigeria. Um, people don't know, but it, it, it takes longer than being a medical doctor. Mm. Or you, they, no, they, they don't, it, it does take. It, it's four years BSc, two years compulsory master's. And then you serve. Isn't for that a good thing? You, 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 you come up from school. You already, you already have a master's degree. But, 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 you're, you're, but you're not exactly earning okay, in the true. society where we are in. Do you? Um, you have children. Do you visualize them not earning after four years of school? Mm, not at all. You understand. So in in the field of architecture, you're not really regarded as anything if you don't have your master's. 
Mm. Yeah, they, they can, you, you might even be paid like an IT student. Is it even possible to be an architect without, being, um, without having a master's degree? Um, yes, to an extent. Yeah, okay. that's, that's where I'm coming to because um, what, was being what is being practiced in um, America and Canada is when I finish in 400 level, um, there's an, I'm an architect to a particular kind of level in, in the sense that you have um, approval and accreditation to, I can design a bungalow, I can design maybe a one or two story building, you understand, something that falls into a category of uh, maybe a project shouldn't be more than $1 million or five, let's just say you can't handle more than a $500,000 project or $200,000 project. I'm an architect to that level. But that may, I can't compete for projects that are up to $2 million because people who now have an MSc are those who are qualified. Mm -hmm. You understand? The governing body would not allow me who has a BSc to um, fight for those projects. And those projects that are $200,000, $500,000, people in MSc level cannot fight for those projects. You know, so everything, everybody can make money at different levels. And then you, that you're a big firm, you've been practicing for like 10, 20 years, you can fight for the governmental project what's going into billions. But what is happening here is you find the people with the big firms still struggling for the bungalows and the one bedrooms and all that with the people who are down here. So these people have no chance. They now all have to have a paradigm shift into the big firms. Mm. You understand? That's, that's, that is the, that's the frustration that is, it, is yeah. going on. So they should find a way to sectionalize this thing the way they've done it abroad. Of course, I can, at, even at 300 level or at 400 level, I can handle a project with all the way. Yes, there'll be some supervision and all that, but I can't mm. handle a project. You understand? So they should give them a chance to earn money and not be subjected to, oh, if I want to gather experience at a firm, yeah, yeah. I, I should, but if, if I want to practice, I can practice to a level. Yeah. Yes. That, Okay, let's talk about, uh, you know, for startups now, because for, on this show, we're trying to give advice, uh, a useful insight for people who may want to get into particular industries now. Yeah. I'm, I'm completely, I've, I've done with my um, architectural um, studies in school, and yeah. um, I'm thinking um, I want to be um, uh, on my own. I don't want to start with um, maybe one of the big names. I just want to see what I can do in my own little sphere. What advice would you really give uh, in, uh, to someone who wants to be an entrepreneur in architecture uh, with all of the technologies, the 3D designs and the yeah. modeling and the rendering you're talking about? What should he be looking at? Okay, where um, 3D design has also given an opportunity for employment was uh, where I did my IT initially, I um, realized that we could be done with a design but the company we were contracting 3Ds to were not even an architecture firm. Mm. Yeah, they were just um, graphic designers. Oh, wow. 3D graphics and all that. And they were eating a, a lot of money. It, that was what was happening. So um, if you, I would really implore or employ that you improve on your 3D design, improve on it. Um, you can work in those firms to gather experience. Because um, sometimes your designs cannot be better than what you've seen. You know, it's from, it, there are hardly any new ideas. Even what we call new ideas are modified old ideas. Mm -hmm. So if there are no old ideas to modify, mm -hmm. you understand? So I'd advise, oh, take one year, two years, work with these firms, go look around, see a couple of places, you know, it will really enforce what you're doing. Then always, always check what is going on in the outside world. So you don't become a local champion. Then when you improve on your 3D modeling, also uh, don't expect that they'll start to pay you the big box okay. all of a sudden. Put your works out there. Get to work for people. Get referrals. If you keep doing more work than you are paid for, at some point you start getting paid more than the work that you are doing. Okay, that, but but uh, on the general terms... Uh, yes. A professional career in architecture, is it rewarding? Is it worth the while financially? Yes, it is. Mm. Yes, it is. Um, yes, it is if you are patient. You have to be, you have to be patient, especially, um, it's not just knowing, oh, I'm a professional, this is what entails professionally. You should, uh, as an architect, you should be adaptable and you should know 
where you are at. This mm. is Nigeria. Okay. Come on. You're not, you're not some other place and all that. We're still growing in our respect for professionals. And it, just, it doesn't just deal with architects, lawyers, you see, engineers, and so many. They, as a lawyer, is it every person you meet, as you do an agreement for, that would pay you 5 or 10%? You know, they negotiate a lot of these of things. Course. So, and if you're going to be staunch and not say you're not open-minded to all of these things. So, at a point, that would happen. You have to grow. You have to pay your dues. You have to, but you know what? Always have a plan. Um, this is where I want to be in two to three years and walk towards the plan. All right. Yeah. Right, thank you so much, um, Benedict, for sharing this um, useful insight and all of the thought on uh, architecture, 3D modeling, rendering, and all of that on yeah. the show. Do appreciate your thank time. Thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful being here. I all right. Uh, it's the Business Insight on Plus TV Africa. We've been speaking with uh, Benedict Ebe, architect and 3D interior designer. He is with Afri Benny Works Nigeria Limited. Now, as we round off, the essence of collaboration and knowledge sharing to educate and empower Africans on trends and possibilities of the future of work and businesses has been brought to the fore. That this was the focus at the inauguration of the Knowledge Digest Africa Conference aimed at building the continent's largest one-stop digital knowledge bank. Take a look. Digest Africa, Africa's one-stop digital knowledge banking platform. It has often been said that most businesses die not necessarily from lack of firms, but as a result of deaths of fresh ideas, new technologies, and facts to ensure productivity. It is against this backdrop that this digital knowledge bank has been put together. In her keynote address, Commissioner for Education in Lagos State, Folashade Adifisayo, emphasizes the place of collaboration. The founder of the Digest, Samson Olatunde, who speaks about his passion for the past 15 years, says the country must leverage emerging digital technology to produce employees of labor for the 21st century. Look at the synergy that you can get from you using mobile, uh, online platforms. How many people can you teach in a class? 30, 40, 50. How many people can you teach online? Millions. So I think that by, you know, because there's a master class component of it, and there's also the fact that there's a market component of it. How many people enter a bookshop to buy a book? But how many people go online to buy a book? So I think it's a great initiative, and I hope many people will tap into it. We believe that uh, many people are struggling with the implementation because they probably expect knowledge from a developed country. And then many things are structured in a developed country, unlike our country that is developing and other African countries. So we felt, why can't we look for business leaders, executive career professionals who have been there for over a decade, right? They've gone through a lot in their country, in the industry, so they'll be able to share experiences and help many people connect more to navigate in terms of Maybe they want to start their business, they want to sustain their business, they want to scale up their business, or most importantly, they want to build a system around their business, which is saving them stress, time, energy, and money. System saves you stress, time, energy, and money. And the whole idea of Knowledge Digest Africa is going to be a collaboration with other young tech guys, people in different industries from educational sectors. Yes, so, yes, how do you think everybody will consult for? Other speakers share their thoughts on the need for a digital bank, including the immediate past president of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, who gives useful insight on the need to create transgenerational wealth. Most businesses that would die, die within the first uh, two, three, four years. And if you uh, are able to sustain a business beyond 10 years, then it makes sense that you try as much as possible that that business at least you. Ecosystem thinking means I'm not the sole provider of a solution, okay? I get to in touch with people who are of like minds, people who can actually augment whatever product that I'm developing such that it moves from being a product into a solution. That way, first you can uh, reduce your cost of delivery because other people are imputing to the cost of delivery. Two, you can have a faster route to market that way because a lot of people are bringing in expertise that you don't have on your own alone. The information on the platform shows commitment towards providing digital learning in line with the digital policy of the federal government.
And that's the size of the show for this week. I am Justin Akadonye. See you again next time. Bye for now.